Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Telemedicine Coding and Billing, What You Need to Know. Today's webinar is presented by Revenue Health Systems uh, and has been researched and the information contained uh, is being presented by uh, Mike Enos from Enos Medical Coding and Ray Jorgensen from Priority Management Group. A brief introduction about myself. Uh, I am the uh, COO of Revenue Health. We are a technology-enabled service company uh, built by billers for billers. Our software-enabled service leverages your existing IT investments by aggregating data into a centralized view and seamlessly integrating this data into your operations, creating efficiency and providing an ac accurate depiction of your revenue cycle. As times have changed quickly in the last weeks and months, more and more of our clients have been asking us to help them with analytics and AR management support around te telemedicine billing and coding, as it's become more prevalent in our healthcare environment and almost a requirement. So to respond to that, we've engaged the experts to present this information to you today. Administratively, I want to let you know that we, you can send us questions in the question and answer panel, and we will answer most questions towards the end of the presentation. We have a lot of content to cover today, and all of this content will be made for you electronically. Uh, you can send us an email at info at revenuehealthsystems.com to get a copy of the presentation. So go ahead and ask us your questions in chat, um, and we'll, we'll get to most of those towards the end. Uh, on today's presentation, uh, we're going to be going through information to define telehealth for you and how that's changing and what it's becoming. Uh, we're going to give you information on clarifying waivers, expanded CPT codes for telemedicine, uh, technology requirements by code when, when those exist in category, uh, what modifiers you should be using for telemedicine, and what place of service codes uh, for telemedicine claims. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our first panelist, Ray Jorgensen. I'm going to let Ray introduce himself. And Ray was instrumental with Mike in putting this information together. So Ray, with that said, if you wanted to introduce yourself and introduce PMG, and you can hand it over to Mike and we can get going. Thanks, Jeff. Just want to confirm you can hear me well. Yes, can hear you perfectly. Great, great. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, MJ for putting this together. And I want to give a particular uh, thank you and shout out to Enos Medical Consulting. Uh, I've done a lot of training around the country in the last uh, you know, two and a half decades. And uh, the, the vast majority of this material is Enos Medical Consulting. There's a few slides I'm going to insert and talk a little bit about health centers. I know we have some health centers on the line. And uh, by that, I mean FQHC, CHC lookalikes, maybe even some rural health centers on here. But at the end of the day, um, what we're going to present or what Mike's going to primarily present is going to be here's what's happening in around the world of telemedicine. If you were in a commercial space, if you're dealing with fee-for-service Medicaid or billing um, even sometimes with PPS Medicaid, um, they're going to typically follow these rules. Even if you're rolling up to the T1015 and you have to list all those different elements of um, on the claim form that, that represent what you actually did, uh, what, what Mike's going to review is really, really critical for you to understand. I'm definitely going to offer some nuance around community health, um, but it's going to be limited because that's not the focus of this program. We'll definitely cover a little bit of it. And there's a document that we're going to be releasing from PMG, um, hopefully later today, if not uh, tomorrow, that is a quick update on what happened with the MLN article that came out uh, late last week. Actually, I rushed, to, I got these slides just about to sit, send, send it to Jeff when I got the MLN article. Uh, and in good CMS fashion, as soon as you think you're done with something, they give you something new to think about. So thanks very much for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, Mike, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the call. I am Mike Enos. I'm a certified coder, uh, consultant, instructor, and chart auditor. And uh, what I was asked to do to today is put together a little information on a hot topic in healthcare, which is telehealth services, obviously with the COVID-19 public health emergency. There's been a lot of interest in this topic. It's become more widely available. So we're going to talk a little bit about what telehealth service is, first off, because it's, you know, it's been around for a few years, but people kind of haven't been using them at all until all of a sudden now uh, it's been very much in demand. So I'm going to start off by defining what it is and the core features of it. And then we're going to talk about all the things that have changed recently regarding these so that by the end of this, these slides, hopefully you'll, you'll know what to bill in what situations 
um, what you need to know about modifiers, which insurance it is, what the place of service should be. All of your questions should be answered. Um, of course, after that, we'll have time for your questions and answers. And if, even then, if there's anything we can't get to, we'll be sure to handle with emails. So you will get your questions answered. Uh, just bear with us. It's going to be a lot of information that we're going to go through on the slides, but hopefully we'll present it in a way that makes some kind of sense. So first off, what is telehealth, telemedicine? So these two terms are often used interchangeably. Uh, telehealth refers to the exchange of medical information from one site to a distant site using electronic communications. And telemedicine is the practice of medicine using technology to deliver care at a distance. So these are very similar definitions. The thing that confuses people is that uh, different people have different definitions and they think that one of these terms is specific to a particular type of services. Both of these services are broad. Both of these terms that you see on the slide are broad uh, umbrella terms that underneath them include a number of different specific types of telehealth service. Um, so when CMS says telehealth services or when an insurance says telehealth services and people in their office think that they're talking about one specific type, they might, that might not be the case. So as you can see from this slide, the definitions are very broad. And on, on the coming slides, I'll talk about the different types of telehealth service. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, first off, we have a number of changes that went into place regarding these telehealth services. So on March 17th, CMS issued guidance on Secretary ASR's waiver authority that broadened access to these telehealth services. Like I said, these services are not new. They've been around for a long time, uh, at, least, at least several years now, but uh, used less than 1% of the time. All of a sudden now, there's going to be a much larger portion of these services being used. So they issued some waivers to make them more broadly accessible. So effective March 1st, uh, 2020, and for the duration of the COVID-19 public health emergency, CMS is uh, allowing all qualified healthcare providers to uh, build these services um, without meeting some of the existing requirements that I'll cover on the following slides. I want to make sure we cover what the requirements are so you know once this emergency is over, if it's maybe a good fit for your practice to continue offering this, but I also want to talk about what restrictions were waived so that during the public health emergency, it's, it's much easier to build these services. Uh, and then on March 30th, there was further um, regulations that were relaxed in regards to the modifiers, place of service, the reimbursement rates. So we'll go over all of these expansions. All right, next slide, please. So first, we're going to talk about the Medicare requirements. Um, typically, when you build these services to Medicare, they only pay for certain ones, and you would have to bill with a modifier GT, which tells them it was done via telehealth. And there are 101 CPT codes that telehealth uh, that, that qualify for telehealth according to Medicare. This has broadened greatly uh, during the public health emergency. They've added a, a number of new codes that are now eligible to be billed using telehealth. And you no longer have to use the specific modifier GT just for Medicare. Now you can use modifier 95, which is the one that most commercial insurances use uh, to indicate when a service that you're billing for was actually not performed face-to-face, -face, but via telehealth. Um, the other thing that's uh, new is you can use modifier, uh, sorry, not modifier, place of service 11 for office when you're providing these services that would normally be done in the office. Previously, they told you to use my place of service two for telehealth, but that I believe would reimburse you at a lower rate. Now they're telling you go ahead and bill the service just like you normally would using modifier 95 to say it was remote and you can still use place of service 11. Um, but these services still must be patient initiated. Um, all that means is that you know, the patient has to be calling in with a, a complaint, a question, something they need to follow up, medically necessary. Um, typically, they would be coming to the office for these sorts of things. What they don't want to see is offices calling the entire patient population, checking in on them, and then billing them for that service. It's supposed to be a patient-initiated service. And again, there should be documentation depending on the type of telehealth service, the time spent, the do uh, key components um, documented uh, so that you can uh, support the level of service or the claims that you're billing. All right, next up. I believe this is, is this a race line? Yeah, Ray, this one's for Jump you. Jump it off mute, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so this slide you guys are gonna see a number of times throughout, and I was just trying for the health centers on board to kind of put a summary of data on, on, on the right. Um, and Jeff, I don't know if you can move your cursor and show them a little URL, that that link is where you're gonna be able to find um, all the, a more, much more detailed information. But in short, um, we're, we're going to be doing this um, uh, through the really the end of June. Um, is that you're going to you bill your PPSG codes to Medicare with that 95 modifier? It's like we were just talking about here. So that's going to be the same. I'll talk more about payment and some of the other elements as we go through. But after July 1st, you'll notice a little further down the slide there in that second half of the slide on the left, 
that the G2025 is a new um, telehealth uh, or telemedicine, excuse me, telemedicine code that we're going to use in the community health center marketplace. And it doesn't need a 95 modifier because the code itself is just for um, telemedicine when rendered at a health center. So the 95 modifier would be redundant. Sorry, Mike, back to you. All right. So uh, another thing that I want to talk about, these telehealth services regarding the restrictions that they've waived. The reason why these services weren't super popular before is because typically you can't perform this service for any patient in area, or any area of the country to bill some of these services. They're supposed to be in a rural area, such as a HPSA, a healthcare professional shortage area, or um, someplace that they don't have easy access to either a provider or maybe they don't have easy access to a provider of the specialty that they need. So Medicare will pay for these telehealth services to get these patients in rural areas or physician shortage areas to be able to get in touch with a provider that they need to talk to. Obviously, that's not most patients. However, during the public health emergency with social distancing and trying to um, reduce exposure and spread of the virus, they're allowing these services to be billed regardless of the area of the country. You don't have to be in Alaska or Hawaii now to have these services. You can be in any area of the country. Sorry, I got to keep jumping off mute. So in the, in the health center marketplace, um, what's really important for you guys to remember is your scope of project. And while it can be rendered in almost any place, one of the things that's critical, and I was on a call with uh, Feldman Tucker, who's the National Association of Community Health Centers uh, law firm, uh, and does a lot of work nationally, that you want to make sure that your malpractice coverage, and I would say this would apply to anybody, that if you are licensed to practice in a certain state, just to double check with your malpractice um, uh, carrier, that you, if you are rendering care to someone who's in another state, are there any potential um, liabilities or, or un, you know, potential legal ramifications? Obviously, only in the event that something were to go wrong or there's a lawsuit or something like that happens. So for health centers, just to make sure you're clear about scope of project um, and, and what, where that can take you, and then it's for email practice coverage as well. And as with all of this, and I've said this for as long as I've been doing this, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Mike's not a lawyer. Uh, I personally, I applied to seven law schools out of undergrad. I didn't get in any of them and I'm not unhappy about that now, but um, I want to emphasize, talk to a lawyer. You guys all have legal counsel on your boards or and certainly that work with you if you're in a, a private practice. Uh, let's check and just make sure that um, there's not going to be something you need to be thinking about that we find out later on. That'll be a problem. Back to you, Mike. All right. So uh, we talked about um, the patient having to be in an, a physician shortage area or a rural area. The next thing to consider with regard to the, the previous requirements for these services, the patient couldn't be in their own home. That's a strange thing about this. They actually would have to travel to a nearby hospital or, or clinic that had a kiosk set up for them to do audio visual. So they actually would have to travel to a nearby hospital just to have these done. It would have to be a qualified originating site. Obviously, that's not what we're looking for right now with the COVID-19 public health emergency. We don't want people to have to travel to a nearby hospital to do this. So the new uh, waiver eliminates this requirement for the originating site and allows for Medicare to pay for telehealth services, even when the beneficiaries are in their own home or any setting of care, whether it's a nursing home, assisted living, and any setting of care. Next slide. Another requirement that is being relaxed is some of the HIPAA uh, requirements around how you're transmitting this patient data. Typically, there's very strict requirements about how you can um, store, transmit any kind of uh, sensitive health information. So uh, typically, it would have to be uh, rendered using a HIPAA-compliant telemedicine platform. But under the new criteria, they're allowing these services to be rendered using any non-public facing radio communication product, I'm sorry, remote communication product that is available to communicate with the patients. This includes the use of commonly owned devices like smartphones or tablets or laptop computers. Um, so this is gonna make it a lot easier to build these services as opposed to having to have them travel to a nearby clinic or, or hospital or someplace that has uh, a place for them to do this and then use a software that is HIPAA compliant. Patients can do this in their own home with uh, an ordinary smartphone or tablet. Next slide. Now for HIPAA compliance, obviously that's going to pose some unique challenges. And this is sort of the way that they're doing this is they're saying it's not okay, but they're not going to audit you. It's the way that Medicare typically does this. So uh, covered healthcare providers may use popular applications that allow for video chats, including Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video services, Google Hangouts, uh, Skype, um, to provide these telehealth services that typically 
the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, would impose penalties for noncompliance with HIPAA if you use these uh, routinely to communicate with your patients. But during the public health emergency, they said they're not going to be uh, auditing anybody or imposing any sanctions so long as there, as there is a good faith effort to protect patient privacy. So again, as long as the patient's in their own home, the provider is in their home or office or in some private setting, it's okay to use FaceTime. It's okay to use Google Hangouts. Um, what they don't want to see is providers, um, not that you even could, but in the middle of the mall or at the beach, uh, you know, taking out their phone and doing a sensitive patient discussion in a public setting. Obviously, that would not be so good. Um, but again, even you know, even now, all the all the golf courses and uh, you know beaches are shut down anyway. But again, providers are encouraged to notify uh, patients that they're using these third-party applications that potentially might have privacy risks and uh, use all available privacy uh, protections that they can realistically employ. Now, again, it has to be a non-public facing service. So the ones that I gave you uh, examples of are services that you communicate directly with a patient. What you can't do is render these services over public facing technologies, things like Facebook Live, uh, YouTube live streaming, Twitch, TikTok, uh, any similar video communication because yes, I can see you and you can see me, but so can everybody else in that sort of uh, format. So that would not be okay. Uh, even with the public health emergency, they're not allowing that. It still has to be a one-on-one -on -one type of conversation. So they'll allow these types of services to be used uh, for any reason, regardless of whether the telehealth service is related to the diagnosis or treatment of COVID-19 or other uh, disorder. So again, it doesn't have to be a patient suspected to or confirmed to have COVID-19. It could be a patient who you're following up uh, on their hypertension or diabetes. Uh, diagnosis doesn't matter there. All right, next slide, please. All right, again, uh, regarding the privacy issues, OCR will exercise its enforcement discretion and not impose any penalties for noncompliance with the typical regulatory requirements under HIPAA for um, communicating with patients using these noncompliant technologies, so long as there is a good faith effort to protect that information. Uh, and again, this uh, notification went into effect immediately upon the announcement. However, if you're going to continue providing these services after the public health emergency is over, you might have to use uh, HIPAA compliant, well, you will have to use HIPAA compliant uh, software. And next up. So during the COVID-19 public health emergency, uh, you can use these softwares, but if after the public health emergency, or even now, if you want to start getting into the, um, the realm of using HIPAA compliant programs, you may use a number of technologies and services such as Skype for Business, Updocs, VC, Zoom for Healthcare, Doxy.me, Google G Suite Hangouts. There's a number of HIPAA compliant softwares out there. Um, so now might actually be the time to start comparing vendors. And if during the public health emergency, this is something that you feel like you can continue doing, especially because we don't know how long it's gonna go on for, um, it might be a good time to start comparing um, different softwares, the, the pros and cons of each, pricing of each, uh, to decide which ones you want to go with going forward. Okay, this is a race slide. So I just want to add some of the HIPAA things to think about here. And, and, and I'll add to what Mike's saying that you definitely we should be looking at that while this is COVID-19 and, and this is um, this whole public health emergency and the 1135 waivers have given us tremendous latitude. Um, it is really essential to think about, you know, is telehealth going to be part of our long-term future? Uh, I was personally someone I do most of the cooking at home now, and I would love to go to the supermarket every day and a couple of local places here that could get some fresh fish or fresh meat from the deli or the, or from the rather the butcher or from from the the you know the, the fresh fish place, and now I get everything delivered at home. I don't know that my life's going to go back to going to the market every day. When you guys are looking at telemedicine, there's going to be people that this is how they want to deliver healthcare. This may become just a way that we do stuff. Just like you had hospital service, you had in-office service. Now we're going to have this as well. Around HIPAA, and this is not just for health centers, but everybody. One of my initial thoughts when I saw the kind of waving or uh, kind of um, lax, giving us a little more lax behavior or, or, or um, the OCR light, lightening up about its review around HIPAA. My first question to our legal team, because our, our main firm, uh, PMG, we're a revenue cycle management and outsourced, um, you know, a revenue cycle partner for health centers across the country was what about all our staff working from home? And for all of you working from home, it would, I think it's a pretty good question because when we're in an office setting, everything's locked down, everything's secure. 
Um, and it's a concern that we had that when we start working from home, would there be protection? And the short answer is no. That extension of liability or, or protection um, from liability that the OCR is talking about is to the treatment. When we talk about treatment, payment, and operations, or TPO, we always think of all of that being covered under the umbrella, but uh, multiple legal um, firms with whom we've interacted on in this regard have said, if you've got staff working from home and, and that information, there's a leak and something happens, you're not necessarily gonna be protected from OCR. Don't get me wrong, wild, strange times right now, maybe there'll be some latitude in terms of potential prosecution. But you know, one of the things I'm real proud of the PMG team, and thanks to us moving offsite uh, using Markley, uh, you know, to, to Andy Verna and her whole crowd. And even what Jeff um, and folks are doing with Revenue Health, we went work from home and didn't miss a beat. The whole thing happened within a few days. Uh, and the Revenue Health software allows us to track all of our staff, what they're doing, like by keystroke, everything's locked down. But even if your systems are locked down like our systems are, part of our compliance training now is to talk to the staff about who else lives with you, what other adults are in the house that could have access to systems. You know, what, what, silly thing, but how long does your system stay on um, if someone were to step away from the computer for a moment. Terrible story I heard years ago at a billing conference. They were allowing some people to work from home. They were telecommuting. And this one person lived in a home, didn't know their husband had been uh, an identity theft, you know, or maybe it was a husband, boyfriend, whatever it was. The guy stole oodles of data. The woman ended up losing her job. The firm got you know, a major lawsuit against them. You just want to be thoughtful. There's a lot to think about more broadly than just COVID-19. If this is something we're going to do longer term, how do we make sure we get into a HIPAA secure environment regardless of where work's being done, regardless of where the patient is, and regardless of how you're deciding to render care down the road. Go ahead, sorry, thanks. Good, good notes. Um, another flexibility that they're offering is regarding to co-pays. This is one of those things that's uh, always been a sticky point for any office who bills Medicare patients. Um, and you know that you know, if you're billing Medicare, you're accepting Medicare as allowable. When you have to bill a patient, you have to make a good faith effort to collect that balance. You're not allowed to just routinely write off co-pays or co-insurances. But during the public health emergency, they actually started off with this announcement that you, they would give the offices flexibility to accept what Medicare paid for these telehealth services and choose if they wanted to reduce or waive the cost sharing for the beneficiaries. Now, there's a modifier I'm going to be talking about coming up that they actually just recently announced that they'll start accepting, which is when you bill the, the services with the modifier, they will actually pay 100% and there will be no cost sharing. Uh, cost sharing. All right, next slide. So something interesting to think about um, on the sliding fee discount program or sliding fee discount scale. So uh, whether you're in a, you know, if you have a Title 10 money that you're receiving around family planning, or you're just working as a health center, or you're in any other entity, like maybe a critical access hospital, where you might have some sliding fees and, and that sort of um, system. Um, there are guidelines around the HRSA compliance plan. If you haven't read the HRSA compliance plan around sliding fee discount program, it's frankly a pretty good read. Uh, it's, I think it's 79 pages, but it, it's really very, very readable and understandable. If you're going to waive fees under this um, public health emergency, you need written policy. The board has to update a sliding fee discount program at a health center every three years. And you want to make sure, especially around this, that they'd be updating those data. Um, that you are allowed special public health emergency relief, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, or certainly now pandemics. Um, but if you're going to think about doing something unique in terms of relief, understand the difference between a nominal fee reduction. And by that, I mean the HRSA compliance plan says you should have a nominal fee. So anyone that's you know, up to 100% of poverty, let's say pays 20 bucks, but maybe people who are at 50% of poverty or below pay nothing. You can have different nominal fees. You can even waive obligatory fees. But again, get it, written, get it in writing. Make sure we're doing it the same at all of our locations so all of our patients are treated with equanimity. And again, legal counsel. Make sure they approve the program, the board approves the program, and everybody agrees that what we're doing is on the up and up. Back to you, Mike. Thanks. Okay, so uh, which providers can furnish these services? So um, eligible providers would be anybody who's a Medicare qualified provider. And CMS has also temporarily waived some requirements that will allow physicians who hold licenses in other states or have a um, inactive or expired license as long as it was in good standing to help provide these services. So check with your uh, local state regulations regarding that. And a range of providers such as doctors, nurse practitioners, mid-level providers, uh, physician assistants, certified nurse midwives, certified nurse anesthetists, 
clinical psychologists and licensed clinical social workers, as well as registered dietitians, can all provide different types of telehealth services to their patients. Next slide. Now, oh. No worries. In the health center marketplace, uh, just obviously think back to the days of the all-inclusive rate for Medicare. Uh, and bear in mind, folks, the information I'm giving for the FQHC in this presentation, uh, the, the additional details separate from what Mike is doing, is I'm talking about Medicare policy. So that's why I'm saying the Medicare all-inclusive rate, they define core providers, uh, physicians, NP, PA, midwife, all the folks we just listed here, um, PhD, clinical psychologist. Um, a couple of key things. We've had a number of health centers ask us this question um, is, hey, what if we have doctors who want to volunteer at the health center during the crisis? Uh, the truth of the matter is volunteers aren't covered under FTCA because what triggers the FTCA coverage is that they are employees. There's a cost center for that staff person. It could be a W-2 or a 1099, but they have to work for the health center. Um, and bear in mind that the 837I, which is how we bill Medicare, not on a physician claim form, not on the, the old 1500, but on a UB4, but the electronic version, the 837I for institutional, as long as they're a 1099 or a W2, we're allowed to bill because we're using the group NPI. But as soon as we want to bill Medicare Part B or we want to bill, say, Medicaid using the T1015 on a 1500 or any other commercial payers with the 837P, the individual needs to be fully credentialed. And volunteers, it doesn't make that easy. For Medicare, it's not hard to do. You got to fill out the 855R, the reassignment form to make that happen. Commercial payers, they may already have a number, meaning this volunteer, this person who wants to work, if they're in your community, they already have participating numbers with the plans, but you want to make sure that when they work for you, the payments come to your tax ID. But don't ignore this. Don't think there's going to be leniency around this. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of latitude they're affording us, but there are still rules we have to follow and make sure we're cautious about it. So back to you, Mike. Thanks. Yep. So on the last slide, we talked about the eligible providers. There are some state regulations that will vary, so you might have to check with your state to see which ones specifically can and cannot bill, but there are certain types of providers that are not covered for uh, telehealth services. Um, so again, check with your local and you know payers, the biggest payers that you bill. Um, certain types of providers like physical therapy or speech pathology might not be covered, um, but again, it's really hard to put slides together that definitively say what every insurance will cover. So uh, definitely check. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to echo that statement. Um, nothing is ever all inclusive. My, you could, you know, put um, myself and Mike and a handful of other certified coders in a room. If there were four of us and you asked us one question, you probably get 12 answers because yep. there's, there's always a, depending on what's going on, a silly example, I, I work in Wisconsin periodically. Uh, family planning in Wisconsin allows billing up to a level three new patient, a level three established patient by an RN or an LPN because there, there's not enough providers and that's just family planning, but that's still a payer and that's a different funky kind of rule that you have to know exists as a nuance there. Um, so there are certain things that you're going to do as a, um, in, a, in, a, in a, any provider setting where you wanna understand, I'm looking at this third bullet here, what supervision means. So general versus direct supervision. Uh, general, um, think of like a pathologist, they don't sit and watch cultures grow, but they bill for everything that goes on in the lab, whereas direct, the phrase I use and uh, CMS is used is within shouting distance. So you need to understand if you're rendering certain care and it requires general supervision, well, then that can be done remotely. That can be done when someone's not physically in the building with you. But um, incident to billing, for instance, requires direct supervision. And I and Mike, tell me if you see anything different, but I haven't seen anything lighten up about that, that that person needs to be in the building within shouting distance. Um, and you, as Mike said, you need to know what the different payers want to have happen. There are other services like transitional care management. This is the second bullet, chronic, um, uh, chronic care management, behavioral health interventions, annual visits, um, initial periodic preventive visits. Portions of that can be done remotely um, and you can gather some of those data and they don't need to be seeing the, the, that core provider face to face. But know your limits, know what the codes require, know what things are allowed. Um, again, uh, the transitional care management, chronic care management of these other what I'm going to call the umbrella of telehealth, as Mike defined at the beginning, is different than telemed. Um, know what the rules are, but tremendous financial opportunity. And again, as I said a little bit ago, I think a new way we're going to conduct healthcare uh, during and after um, this uh, public health emergency ends. Yeah, and definitely check with your biggest payers because, um, for example, when I was putting these slides together, I had to do some research about the big payers in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut. And some of them will pay a low level e &M service, even if it's an audio only telephone call. So on the coming slides, I'm gonna talk about what to do when it's audio and visual and what to do when it's audio only. And I'm gonna talk about the general AMA CPT guidance and the CMS guidance. 
But the caveat to that is some insurances in your state might actually pay for a regular ENM visit, even if it is audio only. So uh, nothing is 100% definitive. When I Even though things I put on my slide, the caveat is always going to be, but check with your biggest payers and they'll say uh, another. And Mike, rule. can I ask you a question about that? And I'm just curious. I, I know what I think, but I'm curious. One of the things I've recommended to folks over the years is if you don't have, if you can't find a local policy, then I always tell default to the, to the federal policy. So if you can't find oh, yeah. a payer that gives you a rule around incident two, or, you know, it says, Hey, can I use phone only? Then you have to go with the federal guidelines, which say, right. if you're doing telemed, it's got to be audio and visual, not just audio. But if you exactly. can find a local written rule, uh, just because a phone rep tells you something, do we believe them? No, <laughs> I want to see it in writing, right? Because I know That's people who call back until right there. Right, or they call back till they get the answer they want, right? We can't, right, we can't yes. do that. Okay. Yes. People, Sorry, people go ahead. Can interpret things in different ways. So yeah, unless you have it in writing where you can refer to it, and it, let's just say you get audited, can you? Are you going to tell the auditor? Well, I talked to somebody on the phone, and I'm pretty sure they told me I could do this. That's not. Susie said it was again. fine. Exactly. Yeah. So make sure you uh, get it in writing and in a way that's uh, not not ambiguous. Um. So regarding patient status, this is another thing that is being relaxed with the current telehealth emergency. So typically you can only bill these telehealth services if you have an established relationship with the patient. So you would see the patient, establish their record, you, you know them, and then in an interval uh, for, you know, fashion, you may furnish telehealth. But during the public health emergency, they're relaxing that requirement and allowing you to bill telehealth services, even if you do not have such an existing relationship with the patient. Now it might be problematic to bill a new patient as telehealth because the new patient ENM codes in particular are strict regarding the requirements, but you can still do it regarding what you can document uh, for exam, or you can use the time. And time is actually something that just recently changed. They announced that they're gonna be um, changing the way they consider time instead of the typical way they consider time, which is face-to-face -face time in the office with the patient. They're going to relax that due to the nature of these telehealth services um, to include all the time spent on the day of the service, including pre-service, intra-service, and post-service time, as long as it was time personally spent by the provider, whether it was preparing to see the patient, talking to the patient after the call, summarizing the discussion with another provider, putting in orders, uh, charting the note, um, all of that time is now going to be counted, which is in line with some of the big changes that are coming next year for e &M. So I'm not surprised to see that they did that. I just think it's, it's great that they did for this emergency. Uh, and also virtual check-in services can be provided to both new and established patients as well. All right. So just a, a quick note about this. Uh, just remember, this is, a, this is in the um, uh, Medicare Benefit Processing Manual. There's a link down there at the bottom, I believe. Um, and uh, chapter 13, 70.3, it's actually the, the two paragraphs, or, you know, the penultimate paragraphs, Jeff before 70.4. That, um, and I, just finished writing a blog about this because I feel like an idiot. I've been teaching this stuff for years and, and, and it clearly states that a new patient um, from, for Medicare and health centers, a new patient's billable for the first visit received as a Medicare beneficiary. So let me make that more clear. Um, let's say that I was being seen at a, at a practice and I had um, Aetna and then I, I moved over to Blue Cross and I moved over to United. Well, it's not legal if I stayed at that practice for me to be billed as a new patient every time I go to a new payer, although they probably wouldn't know I was established. That's just not the way the coding and billing world works. Once you, it's a, it's a three-year rule, um, and the three-year rule is based on the providers of the same specialty within a group practice. So if I grew up in a practice and I saw a pediatrician, and then I moved on and saw in the same group practice, same tax ID, uh, family practice doc, and then I, as I got older, I, maybe I saw an internist. Well, each of those are different board certifications, so there wouldn't be anything wrong with each of them coding a new patient visit. Um, but um, me moving to a new payer wouldn't trigger. It would just be that seeing someone in a different board certification under that same tax ID. That's the CPT rule, um, and you can read it in the CPT book just before the evaluation and management um, chapter starts, just before 99201 starts. But under the, the 70.3 in the Medicare um, um, MBPM, Medicare Benefit Processing Manual, it says that the first time that you, a patient is, um, is seen and a, and a Medicare service is rendered to them, um, that you're allowed to bill them as a new patient. So this is a gigantic opportunity, not only because of the new patients in general pay more money, but in the health centers, you get a 34% increase on that PPS ceiling. So more to talk, come about this later on. There's a blog, like I said, I just wrote, we'll be releasing, but it's um, big, big, big money opportunity. Otherwise, what Mike just said, we're following those rules. Great that the telemed is allowing us to bill new and established patients because that would have been really challenging uh, as, as we move through this if we could only do it for established patients when you know, people who need care, they need care from whoever, frankly, they can get it from right now. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Yep. 
Now, regarding the types of services that you can furnish, there's a number of different types of telehealth services. Most people are just thinking of the ENM regular office visit, but being done over the phone instead. There are actually many different types of telehealth. Um, that the typical office visit is called an ENM telehealth visit. Uh, the other ones are called, you know, uh, telephone services or virtual check-ins, and we'll talk about those on the coming slides. But it's important to know that these services will be reimbursed regardless of the diagnosis. They're not, they don't have to be related to the diagnosis, screening, or treatment of COVID-19. It can be any uh, medically necessary visit. As of March 17th, there were 101 CPT codes designated as eligible for telehealth. Chief, chiefly among them is the office or other outpatient visits. These are typical office visits, but also subsequent hospital and nursing facility visits, psychotherapy services, uh, health and behavioral assessment and intervention screening services, end-stage renal disease counseling services. Um, keep in mind that preventive medicine services, so the annual um, preventive physical exam for commercial insurances is not covered for telehealth. But as we just talked about, annual wellness visits for Medicare and the IPPE for Medicare, you can, you can do that. It is actually eligible. So I'm not gonna go through this slide again, just wanna emphasize it's just, it, we for the, uh, and through uh, the 1st of June, I apologize, I'm looking at that date where it says 30 June 9. And Jeff, before we send these out, let me just fix that. And one other thing I found in here that's driving me crazy. Um, if we send them already, we will send an updated bunch. But um, those GO466 to GO470, um, those are the PPSG codes. And they have their own corresponding list of codes that are there. But under the MLN article that came out late last week, the one that's linked here, um, we get all the telemed codes that are that. Uh, Mike's been talking about. So that's a big positive shift that gives us more opportunity to get paid. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we will see a reconciliation coming in June, meaning we're going to get paid our regular PPS rate right now. And then it'll be retroactively adjusted down to that $92 rate, but it's still, you have to hit those trigger codes. So um, e &M, as Mike said, we want to make sure we're documenting time. And Mike, I had not read that piece about pre and post visit um, uh, time counting. So that's, that's great news. And I'm, I'm I'm going to update some stuff from writing to make sure we let people know that. That's fantastic. So um, good stuff for us to think about as we go forward here. And I, I'll, I'll leave that until uh, more information until a little later. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, now, on March 30th, they actually announced an even broader expansion to 80 new services, including emergency department, initial nursing facility, and uh, discharge visits and home visits for telehealth. Um, Go to the next slide. The next couple of slides, I'm not going to go through in great detail. It's just a list of the expanded services that are now uh, covered under telehealth services. Oh, FQ, FQHC slide. I keep not taking myself off mute. Um, <laughs> just remember uh, in, in, in the provider employment language, another thing I learned about FTCA, and I, I'll give you a silly example they gave on this. Uh, it was Felsman Tucker and some folks from HRSA that were out there. And again, I go back to folks with malpractice just to make sure you're asking your folks this. Um, employment guidelines are really critical that it's in your um, document that talks about employing health center providers, that it gives them the latitude, frankly, to render care in whatever place of service is appropriate while they're working under the employee uh, of the health center. And again, I'm very vague, but typical legal type um, terms. So they gave the example of a patient in the emergency room, say a, pedi uh, a pediatrician or a family practice doc is taking care of a pediatric patient. And let's say an aunt or an uncle brings him in. The aunt and uncle is not a patient of the health center, not, certainly not a patient of this doctor. They're giving the kids some sutures and aunt or uncle passes out when they see blood that there was a question as whether or not they'd actually cover them trying to take care of that aunt or uncle if they didn't have some sort of, I mean, and by that, I mean, whether FTCA would cover that. That's the big thing I'm talking about. So having gap insurance is critical in understanding what that is uh, and make sure that we give some written guidelines around place of service um, and, and the, in, include in their employment language permission to act in the event of an emergency. They gave the example, someone's at the hospital taking care of a patient who's not necessarily even sick with COVID-19, but could be, and somebody codes um, next door that if, they're, if, if their language doesn't afford them um, coverage for that, I mean, their, their employment um, terms don't talk about the fact that that's an okay thing for them to do, FTCA might not cover. Now, all health centers should um, um, have gap in insurance to pick up where FTCA does not, but just things you want to think about, questions you want to ask, and as it says in bold there, or, or caps rather, Make sure you talk to your lawyers. Make sure all that stuff is clear. FTCA resources included down below for those who haven't read or seen that stuff before. Go ahead. Thanks. All right. So these slides, I'm not going to spend too much time on. These are just a list of the expanded services that now are eligible under uh, telehealth services. There's a couple slides of them here. The last one does say um, what's not included. If you go forward to the next slide. 
here we go. Um, so you can see all these services are included. And actually these slides do tell you what the place of service should be on these services. Um, and these are all now eligible for telehealth. Um, keep in mind though that therapy services furnished by physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech, speech language that pathologists are not included. I wouldn't be surprised to see that change in the future. Maybe they will cover those services, but as of right now, it's kind of strange because um, they allow these types of providers to bill their eligible providers, but the services are not covered. I don't really understand why it's like a half covered service, but I think um, they just missed it. I think then when they yeah. put the code list together, and I'm, I think so. Cause even CMS seemed confused about it on there. Right, um, right. They did a webinar recently on it. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that change, but as of right now, unfortunately it's, it's a no. All right, next slide. And this just talks about the uh, removal of the frequency met, um, limitations. Previously, these services could be billed once every 30 days, and now uh, there is no frequency limitation. Again, as long as it's medically necessary, you can continue doing these services regardless of the number of times. And even before this waiver that broadened access to telehealth services, CMS wanted to point out that they did make um, these certain virtual services more accessible in 2019 when they introduced uh, the virtual check-in codes. Uh, so they have two different codes, G2012 and G2010 for virtual check-ins. These are brief technology-based, uh, again, patient-initiated communications with the provider, uh, depending on the type of service. And again, based on the 33 expansion, these can be done for new patients. So even though it's called a virtual check-in, you can actually do it for a new patient. And the place of service would be 11. Next slide. And this is the two different ones. G2012 is the brief communication technology check-in with a provider, with a physician. Um, it can't be related to an E&M service that was furnished within the last seven days, nor can it result in a face-to-face -face visit in the next 24 hours of the next available. So we, we already had a question here in the Q&A about that. Um, that's still, that rule still exists. If it results in a face-to-face -face in the next 24 hours, or if it was related to a face-to-face -face in the last seven days, you actually can't build this separately. Um, but again, the point of this service is to prevent the necessity for those. So it's, that's why it's called a virtual check-in. So if you do that, you can get a little bit of reimbursement. And G2010 is the same thing, but it's not live. It's a store and forward technology-based uh, check-in. So all those same rules Mike just said apply, but if you're a health center, you're going to convert this over to a G0071. Uh, it was paying 1353, but they did give a bump up to 2476. I'm hoping they keep it at that level. Uh, you can see the source below where it says that that happened, but the G0071 does have a limit. You're allowed to bill it once per seven day period. And that's largely backing up the point that uh, Mike was just making that there. This is really used just for you to go in and take a, uh, someone sent you something, maybe like it's used the term stored image. They send you a picture, they send you a video. There's a communication that took place electronically and the provider takes time to look at it and gives a response, but it mitigates the need for the patient to come in. It's the, it's the payer saying, well, look, we'll pay you something for that because you know, they didn't have to come in. But if they do have to actually come in, then you're going to use what you did towards that next visit, maybe increase the medical complexity. You've already got some history data and some other um, uh, elements of the visit that were theoretically began um, when you uh, gathered that data at first. But if it's all that you do during that seven-day period, this can trigger. So I know there's some billers on the line that are asking some questions. This would be one of those things for us to track. I'd capture this, uh, the fact that one of these was done, the, the G2010, the G2012, and be clear, the provider's picking the G2010, G2012, and then in the um, health center um, revenue cycle um, billing team, you guys are converting it to a G0071. But I would, when you first see it, I would hold it for seven days and at least make sure we're not going to see another claim coming in. And I am recognizing that many of the providers in the health centers are at least a week, some are two weeks behind on getting their, uh, their, their coding done, hopefully with, uh, frankly, fewer patients that we've seen of late because they're not coming in, they're getting caught up, but uh, something certainly to think about. All right, so we talked about the virtual check-ins. Next, we have the e-visits. These are a little bit more involved, and there's two different types of e-visit services. You have um, e-visits for uh, providers who are not eligible to provide E&M services. Um, so anybody who's not an MD, DO, PA, uh, PA and P, uh, anybody who doesn't bill E&M services can bill G2061, 62, and 63. And again, these are qualified non-physician healthcare providers for an online assessment of a patient. And instead of strictly time-based in one day, these are actually cumulative time spent over a seven-day period because this is not a live one-on-one -on -one conversation. This is somebody's, you know, sending information through a patient portal, that information being reviewed, emails, uh, prescriptions, uh, referrals, all sorts sort of things like that. So you can see there's three different levels here, uh, depending on the amount of time spent cumulatively over seven days, five to 10 minutes, 11 to 20, 21 or more. And the next slide should show you the uh, same three 
time frames, but for a physician. So 994, 21, 22, and 23 are for the online digital evaluation uh, for, for an MD, DO, and PPA, and any provider who can bill an EM service. Uh, again, same thing, 5 to 10, 11 to 20, or 21 or more. So again, it's important that the time spent cumulatively is documented in some fashion to support what you're billing here. Next slide. So just want to emphasize, um, you know, the whole point that it re does require patient initiated engagement. Um, and this is something that we, you really should have a 24 seven secure website. Typically a patient portal is what we're seeing. It is the G0071, same stuff that we're seeing. And one of the hard things in the health center world is a lot of these, you know, disparate codes roll up into a single code like the G0071. So we still want the provider to pick the codes that Mike was just reviewing on the preceding page, but then we're able to, we're going to capture it in that G0071 format. Um, and again, once per seven days, how this, the G0071 is captured in the health center marketplace. So just have a way for you to hang on to it before it actually gets sent out the door. All right, this next slide just goes over um, the AMA CPT descriptor of what's included in these online digital evaluations. So you can see it's cumulative over a seven day period and it includes things like time spent ordering tests, uh, generating prescriptions, uh, going over digital digital inquiries, so secure emails or patient patient portal questions for new or unrelated problems, as well as subsequent communication that is digitally supported, such as email, online, telephone. Uh, and again, this is all digital services, again, initiated by the patient. So that leads to the question is, what exactly is the difference between the virtual check-in service and the e-visits? So uh, the virtual check-in is a brief communication, five to 10 minutes that mitigates the need for an in-person visit, uh, happens between visits to mitigate the need for them to come in, whereas the e-visits are treated the same as an in-person visit. It's more involved and it goes over a longer period of time. Over seven days, you add up all the time spent going back and forth. And again, the e-visits are only when the beneficiary communicates with their doctor through an online patient portal. Now, this slide talks about what to do, and we've already gotten a couple of questions in the Q&A here, of what to do when it's an audio-only conversation. So for calls without video capability, you can report 99441 to 99443. These are telephone evaluation and management services by a physician or qualified healthcare professional. Um, Again, it can't be related to an e &M visit that was furnished in the last seven days, nor can it result in the next available appointment. 5 to 10 minutes, 11 to 20, 21 to 30. Um, CMS does cover these services now. Previously, these were not on the list of approved services. CMS did not cover this, but at the behest of the AMA asking them to cover it for this public health emergency, CMS did finalize on an interim basis payment for these services. So when they made an announcement that said they're um, relaxing the technology requirements, a lot of people interpreted that to mean, go ahead, go crazy, bill e &M services for audio only telephone calls. That's not necessarily the case. And that, that, that's one of those things you need to be careful of because that might be a case of hearing what you want to hear. But if you actually look at the way they phrased it, and then you look at the fact that they're now covering 99441 to 99443, they're telling you that they're now covering these services. So you can bill tele telephone calls regardless of technology, but you still have to bill the right code according to the technology that you used. So these, these codes do exist already for telephone audio only calls. Now, having said that, some insurances will pay for a low-level E&M visit, 99211, 99212, for an audio-only call. So I can't give you a list of which insurances do, which don't. I can only recommend that you check with your biggest payers to see how they uh, will pay it. And the next slide should show you the non-physician uh, codes. Oh, you have a slide here. No, no problem. That's great. So I, emphasizing what he said, you got to check with every payer, right? They're all different. And uh, I, as someone who's done uh, many, many, many hours of public speaking, sometimes do hear what they want to hear, right? Mike, we've probably right. both said, you, you told me this. I'm like, no, I don't think I said yep. that. So, and that happens. And sometimes we do make mistakes. But to be clear, um, folks, you're asking about telephone only. If you're billing telemed, uh, unless you've got a payer that puts it in writing that is telephone only, it's audio and visual. But bearing in mind, not all your patients have both or not all, not all the providers have it. They don't have the technology to do it right now. Um, it's amazing you know, even still that you know, uh, a lot of people do have FaceTime. They have the ability to do something on the phone. But if you don't, you, you want to be conservative, folks. You, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you've been overcompensated and you're going to be in trouble. For these services in the health center marketplace that are not um, uh, covered under your PPS uh, or under the new telemed code, what we're encouraging you to do, just like when you should be capturing a 99211, which doesn't trigger one of those PPS G codes, what it should do 
is it um, should get rolled up. And then the next time there's an eligible encounter that, that gets submitted to CMS. So two different dates of service, one for the preceding date of service that did not have a covered service, meaning a service that did not qualify for PPSG code. And then the current date of service that did trigger payment, just so we get both elements reported to CMS, we shouldn't receive payment on that preceding one, but they need to see that full breadth and scope of practice. They need to see all the stuff that we do. And health centers have a rule of done a really poor job of de de demonstrating uh, all that they do because they just don't submit those elements that don't meet the PPSG code requirements. And that really does uh, underrepresent all the work that's actually being done. And this slide just shows you the non-physician telephone services again. Any provider who can't bill an E&M service can also offer these telephone calls, but they have different codes. So 989, 66, 67, and 68. And these are also now covered by CMS. But again, you have to summarize the discussion and the time spent because these are time-based codes. So it's important that somebody puts in a note that says that you had a conversation, what you discussed, and how long that call was. All right, the next slide is a summary table that shows you the types of telehealth services. So you have the Medicare telehealth visit, which is the E&M visit, but done remotely. Your options there are 99201 to 99215, and that's using real-time audio and video telecommunications to talk to the patient. Next, you have the virtual check-in codes. Those are G2012, G2010. Uh, those are the brief communication-based uh, discussions, either live, G2012, or stored and forwarded using G2010. Um, but again, it's just a brief check-in uh, to mitigate the need for an in-person visit. The more involved services are the online evaluations or the e-visits. Uh, those are 99421 to 99423, or G0261 to, to 63, depending on if it's a... Uh, an MD or a non-clinician uh, for communication over a patient portal. And then you have, lastly, the telephone audio only telehealth services, 99441 to 43 if it's a physician, or 98966 to 68 if it's a non-physician based on the time spent. Next slide. And I'm not even going to go over this. When you guys get this, you can read it. This is just the health center chart. So it's just, it's a similar stuff you can see in the far right-hand side, uh, the different G codes and the different payment methodologies that exist. And then telephone at the, on, on the bottom, as I said, just not something right now we're, we're getting paid for and, 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 and as, a, as a standalone service. Now, as I, as I said, this is a, a, a rapidly evolving topic. So even since I made this presentation, I think I've gone over 10 different iterations as Medicare has come out with new information. So one of the things I want to talk about is modifiers, updates. So as of 3.30, Medicare actually said, you don't have to bill modifier GT. Previously, they had their own modifier. Commercial insurances had 95. People were having questions. So to make things easier, easier on March 30th, CMS said, we're going to go ahead and just accept modifier 95 on an interim basis. So you don't have to worry about um, GT versus 95. Some people were using both. They weren't sure what was going on. Um, so at least on an interim basis, they will accept modifier 95, which is nice. So now it doesn't matter what insurance you're billing, just modifier 95 should get you paid. Next slide. The other major question was the place of service. So initially, like I said, CMS wanted to use place of service two, but now they're saying you can go ahead and use place of service 11. I believe they, they'll pay it either way. So don't worry too much if you've already submitted some claims with place of service two, because initially that was their instruction. My only concern, I think I've already told somebody in chat here, my concern is that CMS is not being 100% forthcoming with this. I recommend you use place of service 11 uh, or, or whatever the place of service you typically would be using. Uh, 11 would be office. So if it would be office, use that. My concern is that if you bill place of service two, they will pay it but at a lower rate. You know, it's kind of tricky the way Medicare is saying that they will pay it, but I've heard that they will pay it at 80% instead of 100%. So my recommendation is to use place service 11 since, since they're allowing it. And regarding modifiers, like I said, you can use modifier 95 on those claims because you're using place of service 11. So the only way the insurance is going to know it's, it's uh, a telehealth service is to use the modifier 95, which tells them it was done for using synchronous telemedicine real-time service. There's a couple of things to unpack there. Synchronous means it's happening at the same time. So it can't be the patient recorded themselves, emailed you a video, and you reviewed it later. That would not be synchronous. And it can't be audio only. It has to be audio and visual. So that's why we, we talk about FaceTime, uh, things like that. That would be fine. Um, if it wasn't there, you have to use the appropriate code that supports what you did, Bill. Next slide. I'm going to leave this as is. We've talked about it a bunch, and uh, so we're just for sake of time, we'll keep moving. Okay. Uh, the next slide should just have to do with cost sharing. Um, so, like I said, there is um, 
the uh, flexibility for cost sharing. I'm actually having a modifier coming up CS that talks about how they're going to handle that. So we can go ahead and skip this slide. Yeah, skip this one too. Just get to the one that says billing with modifier CS. That's the main event. Here we are. So um, this is a relatively new uh, announcement from CMS. On March 18th, they said you can go ahead and bill Medicare for Part B services using modifier CS on the applicable claim lines to identify that the service is not, I'm sorry, is, is subject to the cost sharing waiver for the COVID-19 testing related service and should not charge Medicare patients for any coinsurance or deductibles. So professional claims, pro uh, physicians and practitioners who did not initially submit claims um, with modifier C C CS would have to resubmit their claims with that modifier to get 100% reimbursement. Instead of um, maybe even nothing where you just bill the patient, CMS will actually process those and pay even if the patient has not yet met their deductible. Next slide. I was okay if you yeah, yeah. Regarding di diagnosis coding, again, I've already made this point a couple of times, but it doesn't have to be regarding the diagnosis treatment of COVID-19. All of these telehealth services um, can be billed regardless of the diagnosis. As long as it's medically reasonable, necessary, you can check in with your patient who has CKD or hypertension, diabetes, uh, anxiety, depression, um, substance uh, abuse counseling. You can use any valid diagnosis on these claims. It does not have to be COVID-19. We can just go forward to the slide that says key takeaways. I just want to touch on those real quick. There we go. So again, just going over the main takeaways here, effective March 1st, these services are now available to in broader circumstances. It doesn't have to be in a rural area. It can be built in any area of the country. And these uh, visits are paid at the same rate as the in-person person claims that you get, as long as you use the right modifiers. Um, next slide. These services can be billed regardless of if the beneficiary is in their own home or any setting of care. That's a big change because once this public health emergency is deemed over, this might not be so easy to do. They have to travel to a nearby clinic, which is going to be a bit of a hassle. But as of now, patient can be in their own home or any setting of care, any area of the country. Next slide. Um, the coinsurance or deductible would generally apply to these services. However, HHS is providing flexibility for providers who want to reduce or waive the coinsurance. Uh, co and again, you don't have to have an existing relationship with the patient. It can be billed for new patients. And next slide. Uh, remember the place of service should be the same one that would normally be billed in order to get the full reimbursement. So if it would typically be an office visit, you should bill place of service 11. They technically said they will still cover it if you bill place of service two, but I believe what that means is they're gonna treat it just like it previously would have been a telehealth and they might reimburse at a lower rate. So my recommendation right now Place of service 11. Modifier 95 should be appended to the claim to show it's rem furnished remotely using real time audio and visual technologies. And modifier CS should be added to Medicare claims to identify the service as subject to the cost sharing waiver for COVID 19 testing related service. And should, uh, you should not charge Medicare patients any coinsurance or deductible for those services that are related to COVID 19 testing or treatment. And the next slide just has a number of resources. I, like I said, this is not stuff that you know, I'm making up. If you want to get my sources on any of the information, you go to coronavirus.gov, cms.gov website. They have a, a newsroom with a number of fact sheets. hhs.gov has the HIPAA information. Uh, CMS has a number of frequently asked questions and tell them, uh, uh, webinars you can re refer to. The AMA actually published a free edition of CPT assistance with guidance of the uh, telehealth codes. And uh, the AMA also has uh, telehealth um, portion of their site just on frequently asked questions and common coding scenarios. So I highly recommend you check those out if you have questions. And with that, I want to, uh, this is Jeff uh, from Revenue Health. I want to thank uh, Mike and Enos Medical Coding for the amount of time that they put in and offering such a broad amount of expertise. And, and Ray uh, from PMG really want I really appreciate you coming in to offer us some insight as to how these things apply to community health um, and community health centers. Um, we have a number of questions uh, and we're going to get to them all either live uh, or in writing. So we won't get to all of them um, on our live content right now. Um, some of the questions, uh, Ray, I'm going to defer uh, to some of the work that PMG is doing uh, on the recent MLM that was released for community health centers. So some of those I'm going to I'm going to queue up for that conversation. Uh, but there are a couple of questions here that we can answer live, and some have been answered in writing. Uh, so if we just uh, jump into some of these questions, 
Uh, so first off, Ray, um, actually the first question I'm going to leave, uh, first question is actually to us, which is can we provide more training on considerations for developing a telework billing department? Um, we can absolutely help you with that. Um, it's one of the things that Revenue Health System supports, uh, not only the development of that type of program, but also uh, the software to support running it and reporting and getting data on your team working remotely. So we can definitely reach out to you after the presentation and give you more information about that. We also have a recent webinar that we did a couple weeks ago about managing a remote workforce and the data you need to be doing and how to plan that. Uh, so you can uh, go to our website to find that. We'll also reach out to you to, uh, to give you more information about that. Uh, so one of the questions that I have here, um, Mike, I'm going to give this one to you. It says, if a new patient calls and we are seeing her in the next day or, or so, and the soonest available appointment, can we bill a new patient visit for the call and then an established DNM when they come in, even if the phone call telehealth resulted in a visit? Normally we no. wouldn't bill, but under the, these circumstances, we weren't sure if it was allowed. No, that, it's this, it defaults to the same rule, uh, which is usual. So if the telephone call does result in the next available appointment face-to-face, -face, just, just bill the face-to-face -face visit. Um, the reimbursement for the telehealth call is supposed to be in the event that the telephone call covers the issue and you no longer need a face-to-face -face visit. It's supposed to give you a little bit of compensation. Um, but if you do end up with a face-to-face -face visit in the next available, just, just bill that face-to-face -face visit. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next question that I have is, uh, says, so to understand previously reviewing records, talking with other providers and documenting the encounter did not count towards time. Now we're saying that with COVID-19, this has been waived and these are now counted as time. Is this correct? And is this effective as of what date? I didn't put it in the slides, but I'm pretty sure it's effective as of April 14th. I'll have to check when the... Uh when CMS announced that time change, that is new. Um, actually, I think they might have backdated it all the way to March 30th. I'll have to check to be 100% sure, but yes. Um, during the public health emergency, they're changing the time thresholds and uh, associated with the e &M codes to reflect, uh, it's much in line with the service, with the e &M changes from next year, where it's not just the face-to-face -face time that counts like it is now, Starting next year, it's going to be all the time spent on the day of the service, as long as it's time spent personally by the um, provider. The time ranges are also slightly different. Um, so instead of, for example, a 99215, okay, typically that's 40 minutes. So using the new criteria, uh, it's actually going to be inclusive of the pre intra service and post service, but it's 55 minutes instead of 40. So the times go up, but they include more things, which is in line with what's happening next year as well. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that. Gonna answer maybe one or two more. Again, appreciate all the questions. We will get back to you either via email or some other format. Ray, I did wanna uh, kick one over to you. And let me just uh, go to this one. So this question says, we are a FQHC and we are billing for a telehealth encounter. Do we need to document time spent? Also, I noticed there were some G codes that we should be adding to the claim. Can you clarify this? Right now we are billing a normal office visit, 99213 or four with a modifier 95. We are not currently adding a G, G code, should we? Sure, so uh, real, real quickly, the, what, what we covered about the, the PPSG codes is Medicare only, and there are a handful of states around the country where Medicaid follows Medicare's rule around PPS. If you're not doing med, you're doing PPS payment, then um, you're following the fee for service rules and you follow everything Mike said. So um, I, I'm not trying to give you a political answer, but I don't know in which state, I don't know the, your, your, your health center uh, and your major payers. But you, uh, as far as documenting time, uh, right now, especially around telemed, absolutely unequivocally, you have to document time. How, I mean, you have, you, you know, there's no exam, everything's based on the time that you spent, so you have to do that. Uh, I think I touched on all those different answers, Jeff. If I missed anything, tell me. Oh, last week, G-codes. Use G-codes for Medicare um, or, again, the, the, the Medicaid PPS uh, to answer that very specifically. Um, but for commercial, they won't know what the G-codes are. It would be silly to do that. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate that. We're going to take one more. Again, um, 
just briefly before I go into this last question, uh, we have recorded this webinar. Uh, so we will be sending out a copy of the recording uh, once it's trans, you know, once the recording is finished. Uh, we will also, you can contact us at info, and it's on your screen at the bottom right, info at revenuehealthsystems.com. You can contact us there and we will send you a, a, a printed copy of the presentation deck. Um, so uh, the last question that I have here is uh, I think this one, Mike, is going to be for you. Uh, and it says, I am a facility coder who codes for provider-based outpatient departments. Our director of revenue cycle states the facility slash technical component cannot be billed because the originating site for a telehealth visit would be the patient's home. I have disputed this. And if I understand what you stated previously, the requirement for the originating site has been waived. Uh, so is that correct? Okay, um, I understand what they're trying to say, but I don't even think these codes have a professional technical component to them. Um, I'm not even sure that they break it down separately. So because they know these are technology-based services, I'm not even sure. Uh, I wonder if I could look it up real quick. Um, I, I would just bill it globally, not, not using the, the technical component, professional component. Um, yeah, it, it's not broken down. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, Medicare physician C, physician C schedule and there is no split for the, uh, the professional or technical component for these services. So I don't think that concept really applies to these services. So, I mean, if you put the modifier on there, I don't think it's gonna do anything. Okay, so since it's split build, it's also true that the requirement for the originating site has been waived, true? Uh, right, that, well, that, that was one of the Wait, what the part of the waiver that I talked about earlier is you don't have to travel to a nearby qualified originating site like a hospital or a clinic. So yeah, that, that's definitely been waived and there is no professional technical component to it. So you wouldn't need a, a modifier for technical component or professional component. Perfect. So I guess Ray or Mike, uh, before uh, we let you go with any final thoughts, uh, anybody who wants to get a hold of Mike at Enos Medical Coding, uh, or Ray at PMG or us at Revenue Health Systems. Our info is on the screen. Uh, again, email us at info at revenuehealthsystems.com for a copy of the deck. Uh, we'll also be uh, putting the recording up on this once it's rendered. Uh, Mike or Ray, uh, either of you have any sort of final thoughts before we close it up for the, for the uh, presentation? Um, this is Ray. Yeah, I was just gonna say, this is going to change. <laughs> it's all, this yeah. is going to, and so it, I, I, what I hate is people hear this and then they go and it's different for all the, all the payers. So this is not easy. If you're feeling like this is complicated, it's because it is. So keep reading, keep learning and, um, and be prepared to be nimble. Uh, that's the best. That's a, that's a, my final parting comment I would offer. Yeah. Um, I would just say, yeah, as soon as you get comfortable with all this, it's going to change. So it, it's rapidly evolving. Even some of the information on these slides, I apologize. Some of it is literally up to the minute things are changing. So um, I got a couple of questions regarding the time, you know, the things I talked about regarding time. Where did I get that information? You can get that in the CMS interim final rule that they released, uh, and that is effective March 30th. Um, so all those time changes are effective March 30th. It looks like, according to what I'm seeing, you can find it from pages 135 to 137 of the uh, interim final rule regarding uh, visits furnished via Medicare telehealth. Awesome. Well, Mike, Ray, thanks again for all the time you put into this. Uh, that concludes our presentation today. Uh, for today, if you'd like to subscribe uh, to be notified about future webinars, uh, go ahead to revenuehealthsystems.com. You scroll down a little bit and subscribe to our mailing list and we will send you that email. So thank you everybody for your time. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, stay safe and, and have a great day. Thank you.